You're listening to the J.D. Rucker Show. Let's begin. Today I don't have a whole bunch of stories. I know that sounds crazy since I usually try to squeeze in 6, 10, 12, 15 stories. Today I've got three. Well, one of them is an interview. I've got my good friend Jason Nelson. We're going to test him out. Okay, he he wants to do a show, and I want to, to test him. I want to see how well he's able to uh, to handle the the pressure of of doing a show i i it's he'll do fine <laughs> this is a guy who's been been in the middle east been in combat been in in situations that i could only only hope i could respond as well as he has so i'm being a little facetious when i say that i'm i'm going to be testing him the reality is we want to see which direction his show is going to take and uh so I'm going to ask him questions and see how he responds to those questions. I have no idea what I'm going to ask him, but we'll we'll just play it by ear. So that's coming up. Then I have a um, the second hour. I'll be talking about a movie that is causing a lot of waves, and I think for the wrong reason. I'm, when I say I think, I'm I'm 95% sure that all the buzz about uh, Leave the World Behind, the new Netflix movie that's produced by executive produced by Barack and Michelle Obama. Uh, everybody's talking about the racism in it. It's like, oh, you know, hate all white people. That's just the hook, folks. That's just the way to get you outraged so that you watch the movie and have these these terrible, terrible, destructive messages uh, planted in your brain. It's uh, it's a psyop, another psyop, utilizing Hollywood to to plant messages. Um, and then I've got a third story which I'm about to talk about. But with, before we talk about that, it is extraordinarily important to to not just, I don't want to just do it for the sake of my sponsors. I want to do it for your sake. I want to talk about gold and I want to talk about food. When it comes to gold and silver, now is the time, folks. If you thought about moving your wealth or retirement over to gold, physical precious metals in the past, you maybe you haven't pulled the trigger. Maybe you've talked to another company and you didn't like the, the way that they were treating you. I strongly urge you to reach out to Genesis Gold Group. They They are a Christian company. They can help you to move your wealth or retirement over to physical precious metals that will back your retirement account. Uh, these are metals that, that when you're ready to take distribution, just have the metals shipped to your home. I, I tell this to people all the time. Don't worry about, you know, oh, liquidating it. I'm going to have a hard time. It's not like selling stocks. Well, your stocks, if the stocks are worthless, then you're not going to be able to sell them anyway. So I say get physical precious metals. And I'm not a financial advisor. That's just my my personal recommendation go to jdrgold.com that's jdrgold.com as far as the food goes as many of you know we have launched a we're beyond launch it's been we've been up and running for several months now so i shouldn't say we're launching um we we've done we've done plenty of sales already but uh it's important that you get engaged with your your survival and even if you already say, oh, I've already got beans and rice, I've got some some buckets, you probably don't have high-quality protein, high-quality beef like you get at freedomfirstbeef.com. If you go to freedomfirstbeef.com, you'll be able to get ribeye, New York strip, tenderloin, high-quality sous vide freeze-dried beef with a 25-year shelf life. You don't have to refrigerate it. 25-year shelf life on food that is that is great. <laughs> there's only one ingredient it's beef people say oh you know it, it's it just tastes like beef that's because we don't even add salt okay there's no preserve there's no spices nothing like that it's just beef so check it out freedomfirstbeef.com use promo code jdr we've got jason nelson coming on here in a few minutes but i do want to at least squeeze in one story just one this is a pretty big one uh, it's from the Daily Call. Our pilot allegedly offered $15 million by China to steal a helicopter during a major military drill. Wow. I mean, just wow, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> uh, why is this not making making a national and, and international news? Uh, hmm. According to this article by Harold Hutchinson, Hutchison, sorry. A Taiwanese pilot is under arrest after he allegedly planned to steal a U.S.-made helicopter and fly it to a Chinese aircraft carrier. The pilot was offered $15 million to fly the CH-47 Chinook helicopter into a People's Liberation Army Navy vessel during a planned exercise, the South China Morning Press Post uh, reported. The plan failed when Taiwanese authorities arrested the officer, who only identified as uh, Hasai, in August. 
Hasai allegedly rejected an initial offer of about $6,350 a month to steal the heavy lift helicopter, but acquiesced when the Chinese offered a $1 million down payment and $15 million total, which also, while also agreeing to evacuate his family to Thailand, according to the Morning Post. The Taiwanese Army has eight CH-47SD helicopters, according to, the, to Flight Global's 2024 World Air Force Directory. China massed forces off the coast of Taiwan while offering a plan for integrated development in September. CH-47D has a top speed of 177 miles per hour, can carry up to 17 tons of cargo, and had a range, has a range of uh, 706 miles, according to the United States Army Center for Military History. The alleged attempted helicopter theft is not the only Chinese spy scandal from 2023, well, obviously. The United States Air Force fighters shot down a suspected Chinese spy balloon on February 4th after it tr transited across the United States and flew near sensitive sites, including Ma Ma Malmstrom uh, Air Force Base in Montana and Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri. The former base uh, houses intercontinental ballistic missiles while the Air Force operates B-2 Spirit stealth bombers from the latter. Now. We, if you don't know this by now, and you should know this, if you've been watching the show, you know for a certain that we are already at war with China. It's not a hot war, as they like to say. It's not even really a cold war. It's a, it's a modern war that engages in not just, not just financial terrorism, not just intellectual property terrorism, and not even just cyber terrorism. This is a war where they are doing everything they can to to weaken our nation at every level, including the military. And all the focus with China has been on Taiwan. This isn't just about Taiwan. Taiwan, if in many ways, is just a, a diversion. I'm not saying they don't want to invade Taiwan. They will invade Taiwan at some point in the future. Could be tomorrow, could be next year, could be, could be five or ten years from now. But at some point in the future, they are going to invade Taiwan. That's a foregone conclusion. But that's not their primary goal. What they really want to do is infiltrate and destroy Western society, specifically the United States of America. There's a reason why we're seeing thousands, tens of thousands of military-aged Chinese men infiltrating the United States, invading us already, invading us under the, the guise of, of uh, you know, migrants wanting to claim asylum, okay? It's all a lie. Their loyalties are still to the Chinese Communist Party. They're not trying to escape China. They're trying to work for China. They're trying to, to get, essentially, you know, we, we like to use the term sleeper cells. That's not even really the way that they're, they're just embedding themselves so that when the time comes, when the numbers are, are great enough, when the technology or whatever invasion that, that China is planning, whenever it starts to take place, they already have people here on the ground ready to take control of American interests or potentially be, become terrorists. You know, China's not known as a, you know, it's not like radical Islamic terrorism. China is, has not been a terrorist country per se. But that doesn't mean that they won't engage in, in the type of terrorism that we might not see, the type of terrorism, for example, cyber terrorism or, or industrial terrorism. Those types of terrorism. You don't have to be a terrorist, a, a suicide bomber, to be a terrorist. You don't have to, to do it with guns. You can do it with other means. And that's the part that concerns me the most. This is why I'm such a, a an avid, no, not avid's the wrong word, such a passionate uh, objector to all this, the illegal aliens, the, the this border invasion. It's not just about the economy. It's not just because we can't handle the influx of people when we can't even take care of our own, our own people. It's not just that. It's not just the stolen sovereignty. All of that's that's an important part. It's not just the crime. It's the fact that something is being done right under our noses something is is being planned and prepared that will be destruction destructive for america this could be our end if 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 you had to ask me what is the most likely scenario you know what what could destroy america is it the yellowstone supervolcano is it aliens is it nuclear war is it no i would say that it is the infiltration by foreign entities into the united states in preparations for some sort of attack some sort of planned planned destruction you know an implosion is more probably the better way to put it they're not going to blow us up we're going to implode under the weight of whatever they have planned and i'm not saying that's going to happen i'm saying that's the most likely scenario 
So, and I will be sure when I get Jason Nelson on, I will be sure to to ask him what his thoughts are on this particular matter because he is, uh, I mean, as a veteran, uh, a combat disabled veteran, he's been there. I don't think he's ever operated in the in the uh, South China Sea, but he has operated in the Middle East. He knows his stuff when it comes to all these types of psychological warfare, crypto, uh, cyber warfare, and and infrastructure warfare. So let's go to to Jason Storm Nelson. There's a lot of big news coming out across the world. We face this every single day. Uh, but sometimes it's good to just take a step back and talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk to the people around you that, that make a difference in your life. And that's why I'm very blessed, pleased, and honored to have my good buddy, Jason Storm Nelson, joining us today. Jason, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, J.D. How's your holiday season? Yeah, it, I don't – it's never different for me. I'm I'm not a uh, – a holiday season guy, you know, um, we have family over for Thanksgiving, uh, and then it pretty much goes to normalcy you move, you, from there. Do you, do you go mo up into a little cave with your tiny dog and, and complain <laughs> about all the villagers below singing carols? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I get really upset with, with all of the, the songs and, and everything like that. It just bugs me to death. It's okay. You know, why, it's okay, why do they have to sing out loud? Why can't I, I they sing silently? I know it's silent night, right? I mean, what I, I silent know you, night. I want I you, a silent night. Bah, I know you well enough to know that humbug. your heart is four times too big, uh, and it's okay, even though you yeah, play that's, off. That's this, the myocarditis. Is that, is that what it is? That's the you myocarditis. Didn't take the shot. I know you didn't take the shot. I didn't take the shot. Uh, Nor have I had COVID. Oddly enough, I thought I did, uh, but but we did not. So for those who don't know, Jason is my one of my partners at wholecows.com. So we're definitely going to be talking about beef at some point, maybe we, we, if we can remember to do it or if Jason can spin the conversation around. But I wanted to talk about two important shows, first and foremost. So Jason is in the process of putting together, you know, he's he's an old radio guy. He's he's done it all, been on, uh, he's on interviews pr pretty much two or three times a day lately. Uh, so he knows how to do radio, and we've been talking to him about doing his own show. Uh, the question is, what do we want? Do we want it to be about nothing? Do we want it to be about something? Does he want to do do comedy, family? I mean, the thing is that the guy's a polymath. Okay, He knows a little bit about pretty much everything. He knows a lot about a lot of things. And he's also funny and entertaining, which is what I would actually have him on my show more often if he wasn't so funny, because that's a challenge for me since I'm not funny. But uh, but hey, you know, it is it is what it is. So I'm going to turn to yes, you are, the audience first. I'm not funny. I'm going to turn to the audience <laughs> first. Didn't argue fast and enough. you guys reach out to me. Go to jdrucker.com slash talk, jdrucker.com slash talk. And you tell me, you know, after obviously listening to Jason for a little while, you tell me what you think Jason should do his show about. And then whoever wins, the, the best the best person will get a free subscription to Jason's show, which will be free, of course. But <laughs> the entire show will be free. But hey, your free subscription will be special. And Jason will call you out online if you have the winning the winning uh the winning show no, idea. No. <laughs> But speaking of shows, did you hear that that Tucker Carlson is starting the Tucker Carlson Network? It, you know, one of the things that I find, I I knew when he left Fox that he was going to kind of take on some sort of like different, uh, we'll call it a paradigm shift. I know that he has people that know the value inherent in the Tucker brand. I knew that someone was going to back him. Uh, I didn't think he, uh, like a lot of people who've left in the past and you see their audience sort of completely have, like let's say a Bill O'Reilly or something like that. I, I don't think Tucker I think Tucker carries with him. He's kind of like he's kind of like Donald Trump in that he has this large core audience that's just going to stick with him. And they did. And so I think it's awesome. I think the question is, is whether or not the landscape is so muddied that people I mean, I don't think that people understand they're supposed to support this. You know what I mean, J.D.? Like I look at people who don't have a blue check on Twitter and then they argue that Twitter should have free speech and that it's not doing enough for conservatives. And I said, well, you know, if every conservative bought into Twitter, uh, then you probably they would listen to you because you're the consumer. And so, you know, I think it's a lot of this is consumer driven and whether or not Tucker continues to get that support and whether or not he gets the viewers will be a lot um, to dictate whether or not that network is successful and what drives it. What is going to drive it? I mean, you, you mentioned his base. That's that's obvious there. Um, but I think people think I, I saw a lot of tweets or. X's. I don't even know what they're called anymore. I'm still going to stick with Twitter. Posts? Uh, 
Post, is that what it's called? They're I called see a post, lot of yeah. Yeah, I see a lot of tweets. <laughs> Contrarian. I see a lot of tweets today about, hey, you know, uh, uh, this is the end for Fox News. It's over. And I'm thinking to myself, we're talking about an absolute juggernaut with with multiple studios and and locations, satellite locations and affiliates across the globe, you know, with with literally tens of thousands of employees. And Tucker's got he's got his production crew. He's probably got some money behind him. But unless somebody's going to going to plop down, say, say, I don't know, 40 or 50 billion dollars, he's not going to be a true competitor other than that he will get viewership that's that's far beyond the money that he spends. We know that. But is he really is it is he a Fox News killer? You know, so <clears throat> Fox News, when you look at obviously, you know, a lot more about media infrastructure than most people do. And, and we don't want to get all down in the weeds about it. But everything from their uh, FEC, you know, they have uh, uh, airwaves that they own, their affiliates, things like that. And and there's a lot that they have. There's a lot of Americans that don't have regular high speed Internet access. So the idea of watching something on the Internet isn't supplanted yet. A TV is still a thing. You know what I mean? So. With Fox News going into a lot of those uh, rural areas and things like that, I think that it's hard to create a uh, a complete competitor when the infrastructure for Internet and other things like that just aren't there for the consumer. The type of people who would gladly switch to a Tucker Carlson thing. So that's where Fox News maintains sort of uh, supremacy. But you're going to we look at the market share for that and the, eight, the 18 to 40 year old demographic, right, where everybody's trying to or 18 to 30 year old. I don't know. Uh, but they're trying to where they're spending their ad dollars. That's what drives everything. And um, the fact of the matter is viewership is down something like 80 percent for all networks across over the last decade. I, I don't know how much longer it's sustainable. If it wasn't for legacy infrastructure, I don't even know if they'd be able to continue. But then you ask yourself, who's going to advertise on Tucker's network, right? So we already know that, oh, you will, right? But <laughs> We will. Uh, but what I'm saying is, is that who drives the money right now towards these larger networks? And predominantly, it's it's Big Pharma, right? And if Tucker takes money from Big Pharma, well, that's going to be uh, obviously against his mission. Um, then we talk about other big tech. They're big spenders. Uh, how much of big tech is going to spend? How much money can Elon Musk send in his direction to continue to float him? So uh, there's so many questions that come into that. And and again, that's getting down in the weeds on a lot of this. But I mean, as far as viewership, I don't know. I, are you going to watch? Because I would watch. So I don't watch much of anything. I'm I'm a very bad watcher. I didn't watch Tucker Carlson when he was on Fox News. I haven't seen any of his full episodes yet. I'm sure that I just lost about about half of my viewership. With oh my gosh, you don't don't watch Tucker. It's nothing against Tucker. I, I think Tucker's great. I don't watch anybody. Okay, well, that's not your job. Yeah, that's not I your mean, job. I mean, watcher. your job is not to sit there and watch Tucker Carlson. You don't report on the media. But I, I mean, you've seen his segments. I've seen his intros. I mean, yes. I, I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't. I've never sat down and and watched a single show on Fox News from start to finish. But then again, I've never watched any news show from start to finish. I, I, I don't have a desire well, to watch for, commercials. Except for the JD Rucker show, of course. I watch I mean, that daily. A, right. That's a given. <clears throat> Come on. But that's no, so, but that's listening. I can do that while I'm driving around. I can't listen to you know. Ah, I got good. you. Okay. Uh, okay. I can drive good around recovery. and listen, and this is no, no, but that's true actually. You know, between <laughs> going out to here and to all of our uh uh different um facilities and things like that, I spend a lot of time on the road here in central Texas. And so for me, listening and again that we talk about what could Tucker do. Making an easily translatable format uh, that goes across multiple mediums is something that could work. You know, it works for Joe Rogan. Uh, you can uh, people sit and watch his interviews, but they also listen to his podcast, and it's the same thing essentially. Um, so, can you be successful across multiple mediums in the same you know programming? That's a question that I think he could capture an audience that way. Maybe I should call him. I got his number. Oh, you know, his, yeah. you've got his producer's number. Yeah, call. Uh, is, is the, the producer go with him, or were you talking to the Fox News producer? No, I think it's a Fox News producer. I don't think that uh, uh, Tucker's people, all of them, went with him. But I, <laughs> I yes. Or me, we should tell Tucker. <laughs> we should we should tell the uh, we should tell that story real quick. So so uh, I'll go ahead and tell it. So they were. Um, 
it was, it was right around the time when all these crazy things were happening with eggs and chickens and cows and all this stuff. And they contacted uh, Jason Tucker Carlson show contacted Jason to have him come on the show and talk about it. And there was a little bit of a snafu. He ended up getting bumped and they're like, okay, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get you on, on here in the near future. And then like two weeks later, Tucker was fired from Fox news. So we never actually got to be on the show. Which <clears throat> Tucker and I know just for if, in case people don't realize this, Tucker does watch the show, of course. Who doesn't? Uh, right. But uh, but Tucker, you know, contact me jdrucker.com slash talk. I'll get you in contact with Jason. We'll get him on on your new show. But yeah, uh, I thought thought that was funny. So um, anyway, let's let's switch gears to something a little bit less controversial. Let's talk about groomers. You know, for those who don't know, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, for those who don't know, Jason is a groomer, but I won't say that because that's wrong. That's he's the exact opposite of a groomer. He's a he's a a groomer uh, hunter, b- pretty much. Um, Jason is a family man. He's he's got like like seventeen kids or something like that, and <laughs> you can see all of them on his very very popular Twitter account, which you can follow at twitter.com slash real Jason Nelson. And he he has his family right there, and this is why people follow him. It's funny they follow me because I say dumb things about the World Economic Forum, and uh, that's I've been on Twitter since like literally the beginning. I think I was user number like eleven hundred or something like that. Um, Jason started on Twitter like like a little uh, just not very long ago, and all of a sudden he's like much bigger on Twitter than me. And his secret to his success is that he shares his beautiful, wonderful family. So back to the topic of groomers. You posted a tweet, a post, X post, whatever you want to call it. You posted one earlier about grooming. This is a, this is obviously a a challenge here in the United States, and it's a growing challenge. My question for you is, why? Why is this just coming out now? Is it the internet? Is it Disney? Is it is it the Satanists? Is it the globalists? What's going on, Jason? You know, I think what happened was uh, a lot. COVID had one positive side effect, the lockdowns. There's like literally one positive side effect. And that was so many parents were suddenly made aware of the curriculum that their children uh, were uh, presented in school. They were made aware because they were home with them of what they were searching on the internet, what they were watching, uh, the fads. You saw a lot of parents get involved. And and I, I, I will mock those parents relentlessly for doing TikTok for dance videos. But Nonetheless, I think that you saw a lot of parents who may not have normally been aware of what media or uh, curriculum that their children were consuming that suddenly were made aware of it. And and, and it coincided for a reason. You saw a lot of anger at uh, at at traditional um, institutions, if you will. And and the backlash, of course, was going to eventually come when you start sitting here and everyone started forcing uh boys into girls sports and into girls locker rooms and things like that. Again, you couple that with the COVID policies and parents being able to actually view everything um, their kids were consuming. I think it was a perfect recipe for this, I think, for them to push back and and be aware of it. So it's always been there. Now, the problem is, is that once it's become more prevalent, now you have the evil that's out there that says, OK, well, I'm going to go ahead and can, and now I know of more evil and I'm going to perpetuate it. And that's the sad fact is that there are people who've rallied behind the banner of this uh, multicolored preschool flag that they've created where they want to groom children and they somehow have just lost all perspective whatsoever on what their actual role is. Mm-hmm. For those who couldn't tell, this is uh, I didn't tell Jason this. <laughs> And so he's getting to hear this for the first time as well. As we develop his show, as we decide what what to do with it, and I encourage everybody to listen and then to reach out at jdrucker.com slash talk to let us know what you think Jason's show should be about. But I didn't tell him this. I'm going to throw just the oddest questions from a wide variety of topics at him and see how he handles it, because uh, this will give us an idea of which topics he handles best. Unfortunately, if he ha- handles them all very well, then we're stuck with the whole, okay, well, I guess I guess it'll just be about everything. So with that said, I'm going to dive into your history a bit. As a, uh, as a combat disabled veteran of the U.S. Army, also a former U.S. Marine, so you've, you've seen both sides of of the the ground ground attack so to speak we are as a nation currently looking at uh, obviously it seems as if 
Ukraine is on the verge of losing, so maybe we will avoid war with Russia. It's obviously we've got Israel and the potential there. If Iran and other nations get involved, then we could be drawn into another Middle East war. We've got China looking to invade Taiwan pretty much at any moment. I mean, they it, it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be next year, it could be five years from now, but we can assume, safely assume, that at some point, China is going to invade Taiwan, and then you've got you got Venezuela talking about uh, invading a, a nation. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Guyana or something like that. <laughs> and then, now we've got our military down there doing training exercises as we tend to do. So there's four four different wars on four different continents, all of any of which we could be drawn into. My question for you is: Number one, could we? Could, if we're drawn in, are we in a position to be able to, to handle it? And number two, is there any reason at all that we should get involved in anybody else's war? You know, the United States for so long was um, I'm trying to remember if you, have you ever seen the movie The Wanderers? No. OK, old, old movie uh, from the early 80s, but it's about the 1950s and about gangs and things like that. Great movie. Uh, but the point is, is that there's this guy that's just so big. That nobody wants to fight him, right? And then there's this other guy who's kind of a weasel, and he can fight, but he has to do one of those things where he's sticking his chin out and going, you know, you're going to hit me first? You're going to hit me first? Oh, that kind of thing. The guy who has to know what he's facing before he punches back. The United States used to be that first guy. We used to be the, the former. We used to be that no one would even think about it. The whole idea of holding a training exercise somewhere was – uh, not even us saying it was us showing, first of all, uh, the ability to project power. And the second was saying, uh, hey, you guys go ahead and mess around and find out. See what happens if you accidentally unleash a missile on an American thing or, hey, we've got troops on the ground. See what happens if one American soldier gets hit. Um, now, that's not to say there weren't other bullies walking around that. Uh, and the Russia was a great example of that in the past. Right now, we've changed, though. We're now uh, when we're talking about we're just waiting on China. We're waiting on China to invade Taiwan. That is a fact. Uh, China has made no mixed messages about it. They it, they definitely intend on reunifying, in their words, the nation. Uh, they feel that those are Chinese citizens who've been grossly uh, captured by democracy and capitalism, and they intend on liberating them from it. Uh, they've made no uh, they've hidden not hidden that at all for the last sixty years. So, with that being the case, uh, the question is when will they? And it's when they see the opportunity, when they know that we're no longer. It's not that we will fight back or that we will fight for Taiwan. It's that they just, they aren't scared of us. We we no longer project power in a way that makes countries like China fear us. They've they've entered the woven mesh of, of international uh, trade so much so that the United States can't get minerals we would need to, to run our new electric vehicles, uh, that uh, we could get energy sources that we need, of people who understand how we drill for oil and what types of quality oil that we need. So there's so much that we're dependent on, and China knows this, and Russia knows this. Um, Russia will get what they want out of the Ukraine war. Uh, it will not make the United States weaker. Uh, what made the United States weaker was getting involved in the first place and failing, and just like we have done in the past. Uh, the Biden regime seems to just think that that is a normal policy is to continue to make ourselves look weak and that we will look strong somehow by admitting our failures when in reality we just look weak. We left a billion dollars of equipment in Afghanistan. We've uh, just we're a mess right now. So uh, do I see us getting involved in a war? Um, that's a question of whether or not we're willing to punch back. Do I see us able to win a multi front war right now? Absolutely not. Um, again, it comes down to first strike capabilities and, and the desire to use them. What well, we will only use a limited amount, and uh, that makes us vulnerable. If you're not willing to punch somebody right in the mouth and knock them out, as a country, you're not willing to sit here and tell someone you are all dead the minute you attack us, um, then you're just waiting for an attack. Well, I'm not going to stick my chin out for that one. <clears throat> you homeschool. Why and how? <laughs> Why? As you're taking a drink, I had to throw yeah, that no, in there why? for the, no, no, the, it's okay. I go through why? like 17 minute questions. Okay, so so part A, section three of my question is this. Then I hit you with you homeschool. Why? How? Four. four I asked two questions in so, four words. Right. So why? Why we homeschool? Because we no longer trust the institutions, period. 
Uh, we are college educated uh, parents who are more than capable of educating our children. Uh, more importantly, uh, we believe our children would not be treated um, in a public school environment with the same values. Uh, or they will not be, of course, they will not have the same values reinstilled in them. Uh, even though this is Texas, I you can't depend on a stranger to raise your children in the same way you would want to raise them. And when we put our daughter into kindergarten, we realized that for nine hours a day, 10 hours a day, on some days we weren't seeing her. Um, I don't want my child away from me uh, for 40 percent of the day. That just doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's and not at that age, not the most impressionable age there is. So we took a look at different curriculum uh, curricula that were available. Uh, my wife uh, went through a couple of iterations just to see what stuck and which ones the kids sort of gravitated towards. And uh, now she handles that. So I'm not going to pretend to know. I know that I'm given a history uh, book and told I need to memorize it and teach the kids lessons, which is awesome this year because we're teaching uh, uh, American history uh, and we get to talk about New England and the founding of America. So that's wonderful. Um, and I think that one of the things that's been hardest uh, about homeschooling is finding a way to separate the the schooling from other time because you get a lot more time with your children. So you can use it some, some days they're in the mood to learn more and in some days they just aren't in the mood. So one of the hardest parts was realizing we needed to designate a space. And now that we've done that and we have a classroom, we're seeing even more rewards. So uh, why to do it? So we could spend more time with our children. That's really what it comes down to. Um, and and how uh, as best we can with as much help as we can visiting homeschool conventions and and just applying, quite frankly, uh, basic common sense uh, when teaching our children the fundamentals. Nice, nice. Yeah. The last time you were on our show, we discussed an incident that you were involved with a very a very dangerous and violent incident. And uh, I don't want to go over the entire thing, but I think since we are talking about Jason Nelson and trying to determine what what sort of show uh, you should have, I think it's important for people to understand. Uh, as much as they can about the type of person you are. So if you would, would you briefly retell the story to the audience, just in case they didn't hear it, um, about what happened during a fateful, fateful uh, date night all those, all those weeks ago? Uh, yeah, so I, I know what, J.D., you're getting at, and so I think that you're, what your audience is probably going to wonder is, is that, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people when they're trying to create a program, you know, the question is, why are they, why do they want a program? You know, do they want to be popular. Are they trying to make money? Um, uh, do they have something to say Do people? What's the impetus to listen to that person? Uh, one of the things that I've been very, uh, this is going to sound like a weird word to say, but blessed with in my life is, is, is a various experiences that have tested my abilities as a man and my limits as a person. I say that it's a blessing because I think that many people aren't tested in life. And therefore, when you aren't tested, it, it generally means that you aren't reaching the higher limits and the stratosphere of what makes humans humans, um, where somebody looks back and says the difference between a history and a legacy. You know, a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago, my wife and I took a date night. Um, and we bring this up because I'm a big advocate of, of one, um, the Second Amendment. Number two, uh, I'm, a, I'm a massive advocate of, of the defense of women and children against uh, sexual crimes, against uh, human trafficking. You know, and there's a lot of people on the Internet, uh, quite frankly, on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it, who's, who sort of make that their platform. Um, that is, it, it, I, I've seen it. I, I know about it. I, I can visit the border only so many times. But, you know, we had this incident where my wife and I took a date night and we took, you know, a night away, which if you have a bunch of kids like we do and, and you know what that's like, it's it's a night away. Sounds uh, fancy, but what it really is is find the nicest place you can where you can go and get your wife to take a bath and feel relaxed without kids crawling over her. That's the whole point. And we did just that. We went down and stayed at the Hotel Indigo here in Waco, and um, we had a great dinner uh, and went up and, and retired for the evening. And and unfortunately, um, we had a that we didn't that wasn't retiring for the evening we we had dinner and and then our world changed yes i'm giving you an opportunity to break in jd i don't break in my dog know, is barking it, anyway so i muted myself this is my excuse <laughs> to drink more coffee jd well 
<laughs> it has to be a function. Uh, tell us, tell us more. Tell us, tell us further about it. I know I said be brief, be a little less brief. Get get more into details about it. That's my yeah, break okay. in. Then I'm yeah, going to mute so you brief. don't hear the dogs. I've got studio dogs. I don't know. You know, some people have studio alarms. I don't trust them because generally they're they're Wi-Fi based. I like having studio dogs. I've got like a poodle, ferocious little thing, and a uh, a uh, I don't even know some sort of short mutt, um, and they are very good deterrents because the short mutt sounds a lot bigger than she really is. Uh, unfortunately, during shows that means I have to mute. So I'm going to mute again and uh, carry on with the 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 story. Well, JD, I will tell you, I can't wait till you come out here and bring the dog so that my dog will have a snack to eat. Yes, because that's how big my dog is. So, uh, yeah, um, so it's crazy. So you open, so we're, we're at three o'clock in the morning and we hear uh, piercing screams uh, coming from down the hall. Uh, my wife and I both woke up. We thought it was a child uh, or a woman, but it was, uh, it was just, you know, one of those things that you just immediately, well, I guess I'd, not everybody, I guess me, I reacted. Uh, I, I say it would be the thing that anybody would get out of bed and go say, hey, what's going on? But apparently, since I was the only one that responded to it, um, not a normal reaction, but but that's what we did. You know, throw on some pants, went outside thinking I'm going to a medical or fire emergency. And uh, instead, I walked out to chaos in a hallway with broken glass everywhere and a woman screaming into a phone that a man was in the next room trying to kill these women and I did um, what I uh, felt was the most sensible action at that time. I, I told my wife to get in the bathtub and call the police, and I retrieved my firearm and then went. And uh, after realizing that there was no hotel security at all and that the police were not there on scene, um, chose to intervene and try and pull the man out of the room, uh, get him to uh, uh, away from the women so that they would be safe. And, uh, and, and that's what happened. I went through a series of... of engagements at the door trying to get the man to come out and when he finally did uh thinking uh you know we had de-escalated this to the point where there, those women who were already beat up at least they would be safe from then on and this man might walk out to police custody at the last second he made the decision to uh instead attack me uh pick me up by my neck and throw me into a wall I mean, it's a massive man 375 pounds six foot five uh and um I went for my firearm and I had no choice but to engage uh, and discharge around and then proceeded to wrestle with this man, uh, scariest man of my wife's life, you know, that where she hears the gunshot and then has no idea if her husband uh, is alive or dead. Uh, and then uh, danced with this man uh, who was obviously under the influence of something because uh, he didn't react. I thought I'd missed him um, and thought I was about to have his weapon taken away from me and used on me uh, when. Uh, he went down uh, after about a minute of wrestling, uh, and it turns out that I had um, shot him. Um, and after the police had arrived and put my wife and I in cuffs, you know, guns in our faces, that sort of thing, and and they attempted to – I mean, I attempted to render aid at first, but the, obviously uh, the paramedics came and, and um, he died. Uh, but, you know, we find out later on that, that it wasn't all it was – that we thought it was, you know, it wasn't um, just some random man attacking. Uh, it was um, uh, much deeper than that, as our attorneys are finding out that this hotel has a history of of, of repeated arrests for traffic, uh, well, for prostitution, which is human trafficking, and and other violent assaults. Not, not something you read on Yelp, uh, but it was a life changing experience for us in multiple ways. Uh, my wife viewed being a very different um, light. You know, it's not something that I don't take my work home with me. So uh, and then on top of that, obviously, the trauma of the event. But most importantly, I think our takeaway um, is the realization, you know, that country song, uh, not in a small town that was very popular for a brief moment. Uh, I think that people are not aware or maybe they are choosing to be blind to the fact that human trafficking is in a small town. It's in this small town. So it's in your small town. And I don't think many people are aware of the signs and, and the symptoms. Um, and I think if they were, that they might be a little bit more aware and willing to step up. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to engage with people or end in a shootout with anyone. What it means is that you just have to uh, be involved and be willing to, if you see something, say something uh, and do something. Because uh, women and children are being trafficked right now at this moment as we speak. And, and for every moment after, and if we don't do something about it, um, it's just going to continue to happen. And that was our takeaway, and that's what we're going to march forward with. And as we uh, move forward in our lives, my wife's number one concern has been for those women that we had in, um, 
you know, the safety of them and, and as they dealt with the fallout from this shooting as well, um, what kind of reprisals they might face. And and we as a couple uh, have made it a mission going forth rather than running for Congress again this year that instead we're going to focus on on building a foundation that can continue to educate the public and hopefully provide some resources for people who are um, escaping sexual slavery. I take pride in my ability to God given ability to keep conversations going and to play off them. I usually go into interviews without without a question or maybe with one opening question and then see where the conversation leads. You literally gave me about fourteen opportunities from to branch out from there and go to to a nice transition question. But today is different. Again, I'm trying to throw you curveballs. I want to throw you questions that that keep your mind racing in multiple different directions rather than, than maintaining a constant stream of thought. Because I want to ask you, my, my natural tendency is to ask you questions about what you just told me. But I won't. Because, again, we're trying to figure out whether Jason Nelson... Jason Nelson saves the world, correct? That's what we're going with. <laughs> I, I like that idea. I just I figure I could solve any problem. Give me any problem, JD. I'll solve it. You got a movie that you didn't like the ending of? Yes. Well, my, that's that's odd. Very extraordinarily odd. Trying that, to give you something uh, to throw me a curveball, my friend. Well, I, I well no because you now you know which curveball is coming because I was going to start asking about movies. That's that there just you, you just threw. I threw a curveball and you grabbed it and you threw the curveball back at me. So now I'm in, on the spot. I got to come <laughs> up with a different question. Okay, let's. Uh, speaking of which, though, with with movies, I am thinking about. I don't go to movies anymore, which is funny because I used to go to movies all the time. I am against woke Hollywood Ugh. big time. It sucks, but I'm strongly considering going to see the Wonka movie this week. Have you seen the trailer? Are you considering it? And as a parent, do you think that that this is a movie that that we should take our kids to? Oh my gosh, you are now showing what stage of parenting I'm in. I don't even know what movie you're talking about. I yes. literally don't know. I stumped him. Me. I stumped but him. I will Let's say this, because the... you brought up something <laughs> very there. important. No, you brought up something really important. Why don't we go see movies anymore? Now, it's true, because I'm the same as you. I used to love going to the theater. It was an actual experience. I can remember uh, very specific films that I looked forward to, that I went to see in a certain format. And I, I've been thinking about it, and I've come to the conclusion it isn't just about what Hollywood is producing, right? Because if it was just about what Hollywood uh, – there are still films I watch, and there are still actors that I like, and – I know the hidden conservatives, but still, it's not just about that. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be somebody who's turned off all of Hollywood. There are still things I watch, but uh, and and I watch it, and I and I do laugh at the wokeness. But you know, I think the theater experience has not lived up to um, because movies have always been hit or miss, right? But you've always sort of sat here and said, but there was an experience there. And even as a kid, I can remember just going and whether it was just the the popcorn and whatever but we haven't evolved that experience you know uh it became so popular cinema was initially in the 1930s because of air conditioning you know you could go in and, and get out of the uh, the heat and it was really cheap to go and do cheap to produce cheap to uh, to sell these things so my question is for you what would you what what experience would change let's not, forget the value proposition right but what experience specifically would change forget the movies but about the experience that would change to you that would make it, hey, I, I would go more to the theater if this was an experience. Uh, crime. So I live in Southern California. And right now, every time we go to the theater, whenever we leave the theater, when we get there, you know, my head's head's on a swivel. I look, mm -hmm. I always look for threats. As soon as I as soon as I park, I'm looking for threats. As soon as I enter the parking lot, I'm looking for threats. As soon as I'm exiting the car before I exit the car or anybody in my family exits the car, I'm looking for threats. I'm locking the door. I'm looking looking everywhere. I'm walking towards the theater looking for threats. Okay, we go. We, we get our popcorn. At this point, I'm no longer looking for threats because you don't hear about too many popcorn popcorn line muggings. But but we go into the movie. Still looking for threats, still keeping, you know, mm -hmm. taking note of where any entries are, where any exits are, um, where any single single males might be sitting and keeping as I'm watching the movie, I've got my the the corner of my eye on that dude that's sitting there, oddly enough, alone watching the movie. And then as I leave, of course, that poor guy's just sitting here. Threats. That poor guy's <laughs> just sitting here going, Thank God I gotta wait for my kids to watch a movie and you're just staring <laughs> at him. Oh, thank God. Why are you here alone? Why are you here alone? Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. And so so then as I'm leaving, especially if it's a late night one, I mean, I've got I got my keys ready, I got my, my cell phone ready, 
and um and head on the swivel looking around because so, we've seen too many videos of people getting just just blindsided randomly so sometimes but often to get mugged remember the movie annie the one in the 1980s that that of had course. uh yeah yeah okay so Telly remember Savalas. when he goes right yes i know so great in that film um remember when they did the whole scene and they went and rented out the movie theater and they were all the people that were dancing and the ushers and things like that. So you just it's hit been, on something. It's been 40 years. And uh, right, but so I don't the, remember the that, but the I, point I was, yeah, there was a show before the show and there's like 50 people there and they're singing the, yeah. how great movies are. Uh, you don't have ushers anymore in a theater. And I, I've gone to those theaters where they per, bring food to you. First of all, it's done horribly wrong and, and they do it poorly. But the point is, is that, uh, they there's no pictures in a theater there's nobody standing there waiting to help you or what so you're right safety i i don't see anyone there keeping an eye on anyone so now it's my job so that's a great point jd mm -hmm. i mean they could fix it maybe hire more people well out here in california that'd be like 20 or 25 bucks an hour for somebody to stand there and i just just yeah. can't see it Another it's unfortunate of course when we went to uh, and people say there is the financial aspect of it i remember we used to have dollar theaters when i lived in oklahoma and they would be the, they would always be the, um, you know, the the late runs. Okay. Oh so, yeah, so I remember the, those. Did you guys have dollar theaters? Oh too? yeah, we um, had one in, in, in Newburgh, New York. I remember it. Yeah, but you I get remember the, the huge deal. Yeah, well, I remember the huge deal that was made after they became the dollar fifty theaters. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is it. It's the end. It's up to a buck fifty. You know, when when my wife and I were were well kids. We would uh, not literally kids, but when we were young, young adults, we would go and that would be our, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. So that would be our our diversion. We could go and and have a quote unquote date afternoon because <laughs> the price yeah. went up at night. So we would have a, a date afternoon for like for like eighteen dollars. And that included everything. That was like dinner and a movie. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, and that's you can't get a ticket for 18 bucks. But One. again, now, now you're talking about the value proposition again, which is really right. interesting because I did the same thing. I remember I it was a dollar theater and I would get and I would have 50, 10 bucks or 15 bucks, you know, and your friends would get together and you'd chip in and get a bottomless popcorn and a bottomless soda. And and you would just go from theater to theater. The seats weren't even that comfortable, but it was worth it. But now I'm paying twenty five dollars a seat. To go and sit there and be worried about safety, to eat subpar food that they charge an arm and a leg for, and and quite frankly, sit with surly people yelling at me to, you know, and then you got to worry about whether or not somebody's going to hit you in the theater because you asked them to be quiet or, you know, shoot you or whatever, because it's just because, you know, people are stupid nowadays. Not all yeah. people. I mean, you know, some people are stupid. Well, no, I, I think everybody's stupid, but that's just me. I'm cynical. Well, I mean, I'm so, stupid a little bit, but yeah. <laughs> so, so there's a new movie out. And it's getting a lot of buzz. It was produced by Barack and Michelle Obama. It's like uh, the end of the world, something or another. I don't remember what it's what. Stay it's away called. from white people. Yeah, that's pretty much exactly what 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 they're <laughs> saying. It is. They're saying. So you think you know where the where the question is going, but you don't. I'm, okay. I'm I've got my curveball, my post curveball turned into a slider that I'm throwing okay, at you. Okay, got it. So you know, yes, as it turns out, it's a it's it turns out to be an anti white movie because you can be anti white in movies nowadays. You just can't be anti anything else, which is a whole other discussion. But my question for you is: Is Barack Obama actually controlling the United States government? Uh. <clears throat> I would argue that uh, the people that put Barack Obama in there are controlling the United States government. It's the same uh, people. You know, a lot of people forget that the people who were sub assistant directors in appointed positions during the Clinton years left and went to the private sector, where whether it be pharma or tech or whatever, they used their government contacts to go into the private sector and make a bunch of money. And then they got called back to duty under uh, 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 President Obama, where they turned around and had to do the same thing. You know, they, they were now directors, though. And then they left again, made some more money in the private sector while, while President Trump was in office. And then when President Biden gets in there, they all come back and now they're in charge. It's the same people. They're just now it's the handpicked ones all the way through the top and some sub deputies and things like that. My point being that uh, it, it, does it really matter who the president is when the administrative state is really the one that's in charge? We have so many executive offices now at this point that uh, that control essentially uh, what Congress is supposed to do, which is writing legislation. But they are the ones that implement legislation and they do it through their own lens and prism. And then they turn around and change everything uh, to mirror the the 
the whatever the it is that the people who are deeply in charge because we all know it's, again it's where you could say Valerie Jarrett you could say anybody you could sit here and point it but it's a core group of people you know whether it's a Podesta or a or Jarrett or whoever you have a core group of people that have been in charge the whole time they know how the system works and they're the ones that are guiding this ship uh, as it sinks but still they're guiding the ship so. But I say Obama's in charge. Um, I would say uh, yes, if you want to use Obama as a representation of the largesse when, when you're talking about that group. But we're talking about talk, probably talking about a core group of maybe 20 people. Hmm. Is it wrong that every time you now use the word duty twice during this this interview and both times I've gone Beavis and Butthead and said oh, duty anyway? <laughs> Uh, I've had to create a well, verbal tick for when you say where you, uh, you know, when somebody says I'm going to do, do something, you know what I mean? I have to remind myself that when you say you do and then pause and don't say anything. Yeah. So, cause you, cause you're immature. I am. I am. I am very <laughs> immature with our company that we own whole cows, um, you know, a few months ago. And this is, this is breaking news, even though it happened a few months ago, we didn't talk about it back then. Uh, but obviously after, after the the, fow, the the fires in Maui, not the the Fowies in Mar, the fires in Maui, um, Jason contacts me, contacts our partners, and says, "Hey, we should send send some uh, some food their way. They're going to need some food." And we did. And you sent like I don't know ten thousand dollars, which for for a small company um, that was that was a, a big deal. But you know, it's like, it was like fifteen thousand dollars worth. Was, of stuff. was it fifteen thousand? I'm you, taking you, the time. I, 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 I thought we when weren't when you were asking about, about it, it, you told I, me like ten. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, I told you I didn't want to like advertise it, I but, know, I am, oh, but I am going to take the tax write off. So, okay, uh, well, there no, we go. Yeah. Well, let's talk about it. Look, listen, people need to know that whole cows <laughs> yeah. and that Jason Nelson, it's not just, we're not just trying to feed people, which we are. We're not just trying to build a business, all American business, which we are. And people can always take advantage of 15% off at wholecows.com by using promo code JDR. Don't use his promo code. Use JDR. That way I can feel, feel superior in some way. But or you, you can use promo code STORM. Promo code STORM, <laughs> Storm. for 15% off. And Promo free shipping. And ah, you had to throw in the free shipping, didn't you? Yes. yes. Wholecows.com, promo code STORM. Fine. We'll test test that out. But yeah, sure. but here we are. So so you did send, we as a company send it, but you, it was your prompting. What made you decide, you know what, we need to, they, they have these fires. There's people that are displaced. There's people that are hungry. We need to send them bags of freeze-dried long-term storage beef. Uh, so, you know, um, these people eat spam, J.D. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, they do. I don't, You're yeah. right. No, they I, do. I, 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 first of all, you know, I, I say that, but I'm, I'm actually genuinely proud of our products. I, I don't want to make fun of it. But um, the I, I think it's a lot of first of all, on the, chi on the giving side of it, it's easy You know, for everything we've come to you about um, as partners, whether it be for food kitchens or anything that we've wanted to do. You've always said yes. And I don't think. And we don't advertise it, but I think it's important as a company to stay uh, alert uh, and give where you can. And not because you you have to, uh, but because you should. And, you know, if I can sit here and do something good for the world, you want to. Uh, why specifically did we respond to that one? Uh, I think that knowing their uh, – I know what it's like. To, they're on an island, man. They it, it, Stuff comes in on a boat. So if they can't – get the supplies that they need uh, they just go without and i i can't imagine what that's like i i, I genuinely and i've been deployed and so uh i know what it, I, I actually do know what that's like but i mean i i can't imagine being a civilian and looking at your children and saying i don't know if i'm going to be able to feed you healthy food tomorrow uh, i don't know if i'm going to be able to give you food that we know isn't pumped full of chemicals or is got an mrna vaccine secretly hidden in it uh because right now i'm dependent on the government to give me food after after mismanagement by the government that led to a fire and by a uh, horrible uh disaster response that led to uh by the government that led to many people dying who shouldn't have died so those are the people you're going to depend on to feed you i think that's pathetic so we wanted to do better than that, and that's the whole mission of our company. So I think that it was an easy thing to sit here and project um, our giving to match the purpose of our company, which is to allow people to uh, be able to have defendable, dependable long-term uh, food that that is real. And that's the thing about our beef, right? What's the ingredients? 
beef. So uh, I, I'm proud of that, that we were able to do that. But at the same time, I think that in the future, as we continue to look at um, people that we can give to in communities that we can support, I hope that we're able to expand that mission because it is, it is really important. And yeah, it's, you know, um, we love selling our beef, but again, it, the whole purpose of this company is to help Americans. And, and, and we really believe that it's a core mission. So. It absolutely is. And when we had our initial discussion about it, we weren't even, I mean, you called about oddly enough about doing a show um, a couple of years ago, and then it turned to, to, preparedness and survival and the crazy things happening in the world and then all of a sudden we, we own a beef company or, or not even a beef company is a we'll call it a a protein preparedness company i don't know what, how we brand it um but that that's wonderful stuff i'm going to give you the final word i'm going Whoa. to to uh, yes i know i know should I, I know. should i should i lead with the fact that you're getting a present in the mail uh this week i'm i'm moving i don't take presents so don't uh take presents? It, no, it, i, 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 I send them all back present that you might like i will say that it's um is it a oh, big dog? Uh, oh, uh, let me think. Where? Oh, oh, give me a home. That's the hint I'm going to give you. Oh, give me a home. Oh my gosh! So you guys are present, man. I don't have enough room you, with your for your <laughs> 17 kids. I don't. You guys stay in Texas. You got to run. You the, get to uh, the test shop. The, JD. You get to test a new product this week that will be a one of a kind, never been done in the world before. Huh? Are you talking? Are you? Are you? Are you? There's this. There's a scene from uh, I forgot the name of the movie. It's with Mark Wahlberg where he was a football player, and uh, but the guy, you know, he, he calls his buddy to let him know that he's become an eagle, and the guy, but he pretends like he, his car invincible. is is invincible. Thank you. He pretends like his car is broken down. His buddy shows up at Eagle Stadium. He's like, you know, when was, was when was the last time you went a week without needing to jump? And he's like testing the car, and he and he. Uh, He's he's like, oh, your battery's fine. Your cables look good. And he looks over, and there's Mark Wahlberg kind of leaning back and smiling. And he looks at him. He's like, he's like, are you serious? Are you serious right now? Are you messing with me? That's what that's my reaction to Jason. Are you serious? Are you really going to be sending me freeze dried long term storage bison, which people will be able to to get themselves here in the near future at wholecows.com? Are you serious? I, I am serious. I'm super excited uh, about it. I'm actually super excited about it. This is it. This is unplanned, and I just think it's funny. But I uh, am all my genuinely... my kids were all unplanned. Oh uh, well, even so were mine. I don't think I planned for a single one of them. None of them were accidents, but all were unplanned. Uh, <laughs> the uh, yeah, I'm I'm super. Uh, I finally get to walk around with a cane. Uh, just had a hip replacement, so you know. I but I'm going over uh, to uh, the facility tomorrow actually to get it for you, mail it out to you. I'm super excited about it. I the first company too. in the world to do this. Tonka. The first company. Well, I mean, we were the first company to sell uh, a lot of stuff. Whole I mean, cows? Stuff yeah, do, I don't know. You could get cows. beef crumble. I mean, you could get, uh, what is it, taco-flavored beef porridge? Anywhere. But you can only yeah. get whole cows at wholecows.com. Only at wholecows.com. Promo code JD. I'm sorry, Storm. Promo code Storm. Fine. You get credit for it. Either way, it's it's good to have you on the show. And like I tell people, we are. this was supposed to be essentially a dress rehearsal. We want to have Jason on every week. Why? Because he knows his stuff. He's, like I said, a, a polymath of sorts. And uh, and he's interesting, and he's funny, and he brings out the best in me. And, and you know, that's all that matters, is that you bring out the best in other people, which he does, hopefully for you as well. If you have some ideas of what direction Jason's upcoming new show should be, reach out at jdrucker.com slash talk that will we'll send it directly to me i'll tell jason i'll probably lie about it and say jason the votes are in okay they want you to do a strip tease every week and uh juggling like, look they just the, people just say miss jugglers That's strip tease jugglers yes they they just want you to <laughs> nobody wants to, to see a man strip tease and juggle oh my god that sounds so horrible uh, obviously my audience oh. does um, we'll see. Yeah, I'll, we'll I, see. I would believe you too if I saw that too. Yeah. <laughs> now it's an option on there. So it's going to be option number three. You wouldn't believe it. I got four three. votes. Yeah. yeah. yeah JD uh, com slash talk. And uh, tell me what you think of Jason Nelson, what his topic, what his show should be about. And, um, and then we'll contact you if, if and when, well, not if it's going to happen, but when, when Jason is live with his show, we will, we will reach out to everybody and say, Hey, Jason's live with the show. Come check it out. In the meantime, I want to have you on every week if we can. Not Mondays, though. Let's shoot for Tuesdays. Mondays yeah, suck for me. Yeah, let's not. But it, I'm not going to strip because right now I look like I have a uh, a really like I, a blind shark went at my hip. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, so 
I don't want to do that. Maybe again. that's maybe that's enticing. Maybe maybe there's people that would like to see that. Um, <laughs> this went off the rails. <laughs> they can just go to your Twitter account. Yeah. Uh, okay. Twitter.com slash real Jason real, Nelson. At real Jason Nelson. And they can see the, the fake shark bite on your butt. Uh, Jason, pleasure having on you there. on, sir. Oh, yep. It's such a pleasure, JD. <laughs> As always, I can't return the compliments, uh, not because I don't have them, but because you always get the last word. I thought you were going to say because you lost the receipts. All right, brother. Talk to you okay. soon. Thank you. There was a movie that came out over the weekend that's causing all sorts of controversy. Uh, right-wing conservative media and alternative media are all over it because of, it's it's racist. It's anti-white racist. That's the the storyline that's, that's being promoted. I've seen headlines across the board that, that say the, the movie Leave the World Behind, available on Netflix, is just a pure cultural Marxist attack on... Uh, uh, spoiler alert! It wasn't. Yeah, is there racism? Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's obvious. Okay, uh, the racism. There's there's black on white racism. There's implied white against black racism. You know, not explicitly stated, but it's it's obvious there. You know, the the intention was to to demonstrate that between these two couples, and and I should say couples, the the white couple is their husband and wife, and the black quote unquote couple, it's actually a a father and his adult daughter. But these these this pair will say these two pairs are are uh, racist towards each other, and it's not the the husbands or the, the one husband and the father. It's the the men aren't aren't racist. That's that's very clear. It's the women. Okay, you got Julia Roberts, who's who's skeptical right right from the beginning that that and and I'll go ahead and listen. If you're gonna watch the movie, I I that's up to you. Okay, but there's gonna be lots of spoilers and. Number one, I would say you probably don't have to watch the movie. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it it was it was a good movie from a from a uh, I, I guess a technical basis. It's it's an interesting movie, but it's just so flawed, uh, and and flawed's even the wrong word. It's so intentionally uh, it, it's supposed to per portray three very destructive messages. Two slightly destructive messages is the better way to put it, and then one extremely destructive message. And that's why there's controversy. That's why they are trying to stir up as much right-wing hatred as possible. And we know this. We know this very clearly based around the fact that it's getting just absolutely destroyed by audiences delivering reviews. They're hating on The last time I checked, Rotten Tomatoes had the audience score of 39%. You don't see, I mean... For a quote-unquote good movie, and again, it is structurally and and uh, artistically, and and the the acting is is really good. The directing is is sometimes great, sometimes not. But but yeah, I mean, it's one of those movies that okay, if people don't like it, they'll give it a, a fifty-five or a sixty. For it to get a thirty-nine, you know, with with this star-studded cast and and everything, it means that this was intentional. They knew that conservatives were going to watch the movie, and get upset. They knew, perhaps more importantly, that right-wing uh, websites, news outlets, blogs, commentators, we were going to come out there and say, this is cultural Marxism, this is, you know, anti-white anti -white narrative, and, and they're, they're just spreading it. And the reason that they knew this is because the executive producers on this particular project are, of course, Barack and Michelle Obama. Now, I got... I got a tingle in the back of my head whenever I started looking into the movie. And I started thinking, huh, I wonder, I wonder, perhaps this might be a trap. Maybe they're trying to stir up all this controversy, not because they'll get great ratings. Obviously, they're not getting good reviews in in Rotten Tomatoes, but not just be, not so they'll get, oh my gosh, look, look how popular this show was. We were able to, 
to uh, to get the right wingers to watch it for the sake of outrage, and that's true, but it wasn't just for the sake of of getting more viewership. I mean, it was, but not for the reason that you might think. They weren't trying to make a popular movie. They weren't trying to make a necessarily an Oscar-winning movie, though it'll probably get some considerations just because of, of the uh, the subject matter and because conservatives are are hating on it. No, they wanted to deliver the messages, and the messages are seeds. And there's three very distinct messages, very clear messages that are being delivered. Two of them are, I guess you could say, kind of bad, pretty bad, you know. But but every anything that comes out of Hollywood is going to have an underlying message that's that's intended to to plant the seed and be negative. I'm not going to get into predictive programming or anything like that, but but uh, there there's there are components of that as well. The third message. On the other hand, is the one that's that's absolutely disgusting and disgusting in a way that that's it's not like oh my gosh that's that's terrible. It's more along the lines of, huh, I wonder if that's possible. And those are the worst types of messages because planting that seed of doubt, planting that that new concept in the brains of of people, whether right leaning, left leaning doesn't matter. Getting that message out there for it to to percolate subliminally, for it to to work in our subconscious or even be discussed consciously. That's the real destruction here. That's the real, the real, I guess you could say, uh, that's the, the crux. I, there's the crux. Yeah, it's bad. And I'll get to it. But before I do, uh, ma massive spoiler alerts. I'm going to reveal pretty much the, the whole plot. Um, and this isn't a movie review. It's funny because that's actually how for, for any, uh, any JD Rucker trivia buffs out there, the, that's that's how I got started in journalism in the first place. All those those year decades decades ago, I was working for the Edmond Evening Sun in Edmond, Oklahoma. You know, just this uh, still in still in school at the time. It's like okay, you know, let's let's go. You know, hey, do you like movies? None of our <laughs> none of our people like movies. And it's like, yeah, I do. It's like, hey, you know, on the side, why don't you do movie reviews? I was like, heck yeah, you know, as long as I can get two tickets. Got to take my wife with me, so <laughs> that was a that was a prerequisite. So so it's like yeah, so I get to go see movies. I wrote let's see, I, uh, the first review was I think The Phantom with Alec Baldwin, if I recall. Um, it might have been Star Trek Generations. That'll that'll put a put a date date stamp on me. Star Trek Generations. I did a review and did interviews about it. That was that was fun. But that's actually how I got started. In journalism, that was one of my first young journalist assignments was to do movie reviews, and I, I did quite a bit over the over the course of, of the last few years. But this isn't going to be a review by any means. This is going to be an expose on the messages that they're actually delivering. So to reiterate, I got to be crystal clear about this. The whole racism thing is it there? Absolutely. Okay. Is it major? No. <laughs> There's a lot worse movies out there. A lot. I mean, every year, uh, it's not just that there's a lot out there. Every year we get uh, spoon fed five, 10 different movies that are, that are promoting the, an anti-white concept or where the, where, oh, you know, the white people are bad guys because they're white. I'm not talking about, oh, there's a white person who's a bad guy or a black person who's a bad guy or a Hispanic person who's a bad guy. No, it's that, it's the message that, uh, that white people are inherently evil, that all white people are bad. And it would the message would be just as disgusting if it's all black people are bad or whatever, all Asians are bad. This stereotyping, this, this sort of uh, you know, pervasive hatred against the races, that's that's always a part of many movies every year. And it's definitely part of this movie, but only mildly so. So let me go ahead and set the stage. Let me pull up the uh, pull up the the write up that I did on this. You can find this write up over at jdrucker.substack.com if you want to to reference it yourself. But, I mean, it's two couples. Well, one's technically not a couple. One is uh, the, it's a black father and his uh, black adult daughter, and then a white couple um, played by uh, Julie Roberts. Is the She's kind of the star of the whole show. The racism, let's go ahead and talk about that, because the racism isn't between the men. The men are not racist, okay? It's between the black daughter and the white wife. They are, they're racist towards each other. They're racist, you know, and it's always a little bit implied and private. There's a little bit more of it, you know? And, and then at one point, there's a scene where where the uh, the daughter is talking to, to her dad, and she's saying, you know, don't, 
you can't trust anybody, especially white people, or something like that. I don't know the exact quote. And that's got all the conservative blogs, all the conservative sites up in up in arms. I saw headlines about how, oh, you know, this is they might as well name this "Hate All White People" instead of "Leave the World Behind." Leave all white people behind. I mean, yeah, I get it. But again, it's a trap. Okay, it's a trap. They 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 pulled in uh, Barack and Michelle Obama specifically to trap us, to make it to where whether we're going to do so out of hatred or or skepticism or whatever, they wanted us to watch the movie. And we did. We fell for it. I mean, I did it. It's funny. Um, again, not trying to sound prescient or, prescient or anything, but but I my, my tingles were going off. I was thinking, something's weird about this. Why is everybody talking about it? Why would they go down that road? You know, if anything, you would think, so a big major movie on Netflix – um, that's going to be directed by Sam Esmail and however you pronounce his name, and uh, that's produced uh, executive producers of Barack and Michelle Obama. You would almost assume that they definitely wouldn't go down the road of throwing in racism within a movie that's really not about racism. I can understand it if it's a movie that's about, you know, let's say it's a uh, you know Black History Month style style uh, movie. Okay, well then then the racism is a central role in it. This one is different because. It wasn't a necessary plot point at all. I mean, you could have done the entire movie exactly the same and had zero racism whatsoever between between the two women in the movie. It wouldn't have, have changed it whatsoever. But they did throw it in. And that's the part that, that was the, the alarm bell for me. It's like, you got Barack and Michelle Obama, executive producer. You have racism inserted for no apparent reason other than to have it present. And then it's like, okay, so for some reason, they want conservatives. They want everybody to watch this. And it's definitely not for the sake of ratings, because like I said, they're getting demolished, demolished in the reviews in a way that I, I've never seen outside of truly bad movies. And this is not truly bad, okay? It's, it's a well-made movie, we'll say. Not great. I, I wouldn't say it's up there like, uh, like oh my gosh, you got to see this just for the visuals or just for the, the incredible acting that a lot of people are touting the acting is being perfect i would say it was very good okay um <laughs> julia roberts it's she has an actually a very uncanny ability to play a total dorky uh karen dominating style woman um it was almost as if it came naturally to her <laughs> maybe it does ethan hawk did an excellent job of portraying uh an extremely weak and just obedient dude, father and husband, okay? Not so weak that he, he has no opinion, but weak enough to where he's just not going to, to express he's going to try to take the, the safe approach. He's going to try to try to weasel his way out of, out of things. Yeah, it was, it was and then And then on the other side, um, the performances were, were very good, I would say. Not, not great. Um, the kids... The kids were okay. Uh, there was two kids in the movie. They they did an okay job, but um, I always forget his name. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Mahershala Ali, the uh, very talented black actor who plays, he's the, I guess you could say the second protagonist, the uh, co-protagonist. He's really the the co-star with with um, uh, Julia Roberts. And uh, and he, he, he delivers one of his standard roles. He's super talented, so it's not like it was hard for him to, to play a an intelligent um you know i, I don't want to I, I guess he's uh, not a banker is some sort of financial advisor i don't know anyway that's not but none of that's important the important part is that again this movie is a trap let's get into the article a bit um and i'm not going to read it all to you i want to get to the the points the points are the important part uh, conservative and alternative media outlets have been flush with attacks against Leave the World Behind, the new Netflix movie that depicts an uh, apocalyptic scenario. The biggest reason for this was not because it was rife with black versus white messaging. Uh, there are far more direct race baiting messages in multiple movies every year. The reason it was so highly or so highlighted by conservative and alternative media is because Barack and Michelle Obama are executive producers for the project. This is a trap. I suspected it was a trap when I decided to watch it, and not to sound too prescient. That's why I've actually used the word prescient like two or three times in the same same show. It's uh, spooky. <laughs> but I was, I was far more correct than I would have thought. 
Uh, the mild race baiting messages were inserted specifically to get right leaning media to generate buzz, and it's working. But this trap wasn't for the sake of ratings. This was all about delivering uh, very destructive messages that have nothing to do with cultural Marxism or the race wars. They lured in as many people as possible to watch it with the desire to be outraged. Then they dropped their real messages to plant the seeds that can grow in Americans' minds, both consciously and unconsciously. The Obamas were selected to add far more juice to the outrage machine, and once again, that worked just as well as the mild race baiting. People are watching, and uh, they're hating on it with that 39% audience score. But by watching it and hating it, the messages are still delivered. I don't care if you watch it and you hate it. Great. You watch, you hate it, you wrote a nasty review, you put a blog post, you did a video. Oh, this movie's so so racist and yada, 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 and Barack Obama, and Michelle Obama, yada, yada, yada. Okay, but you still watched it. You still had the message delivered. And I'm not, again, I'm not discouraging people from watching it. If you want to watch it, watch it. But watch it knowing that there are these messages in there because that's, it's one of those things where whether you've watched it or not, read this article, listen to this show, and get an understanding of what you really just were were hit with. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of just don't get hit with the with the messages. Don't let them plant the seeds. But in this case, it's almost like as long as you know what the seeds are, whether you watched it already or you're going to watch it in the future, then you can you can realize that those seeds of skepticism, those seeds of of doubt, those those uh, anti truth messages are what they are. Before getting into the three key points uh, let's, uh, uh, that they wanted to plan in our brains, it's important to note that the creative aspect of the movie, which which may get otherwise lost, Sam Esmail delivered, it was really an M. Night Shyamalan motif. And I'm talking about the good sides of M. Night Shyamalan, not the the horrible director sides. He does have certain things that he, he's done well throughout his career. But after the... Um, Obviously, after the sixth sense, it sort of just all started going down, down, down for him. But anyway, completely, it was complete with artsy camera angles and oddly poor sound effects. That's the part that I, I didn't get. Just from a, if I was doing a movie review, I would note that wow, they really did pick the worst possible sound effects. It's like the sound editing on this movie was just hor horrible. Anyway, the acting was strong across the board. The storyline was actually quite weak, even muted when we consider the events being depicted. It's labeled as a sci-fi thriller, but it's really a drama with a few somewhat thrilling moments. I point all of this out because they needed a structurally sound movie that, that sufficiently carried the story so they could deliver the real payload of destructive messaging. With that said, let's get into those three messages. And, um, yeah. The first, it, it's, I'll go ahead and tell you up front, these messages that they're delivering go in reverse order from least important to most important. Um, every movie delivers messages. Every movie has an intention, whether that intention is being delivered by the writers and or director, whether it's being delivered by the producer, occasionally when it's being delivered by the actors, generally speaking, the actors do their messaging when they're off the screen. You know, they can, you got, what is their name? Jessica Chastain, you know, she can do all these movies about guns and about war and about this, that. But then when she's out, out and about in the real world, she's like, oh my gosh, we should ban all firearms, you know. Uh, so they generally do their messaging when they're out, out uh, virtue signaling to the world. But directors, writers, that their messaging is is through the art form itself. It's through the the movie, the television show, the the painting, the whatever. Okay, that's how they deliver their messages. And oftentimes these messages are are overt, such as the race, the the cultural Marxism. That's inherent or that's apparent in this movie, but other times it's the the subliminal, the, the the unconscious or subconscious messages that they deliver that are the most damaging. So let's get started. The first one is a a biblical understanding ridicule. Let me before I get into that, let me uh, for those who just you have no desire to watch the movie, I'll go ahead and break it down for you. And again, even if you've already watched, whether you've watched it or not, there spoiler alerts. I'm going to break down the entire movie. Briefly, I'm not going to go over a scene by scene analysis. I'm not going to be playing any of it for you, but I do want you to know, you know, a synopsis of what the movie's about. Okay. Uh, so, spoiler alert now for the next probably 10 minutes, I'm going to go very into detail in the movie. 
So it starts off with um, with this couple. You know, they they establish right up front, just like this is what Sam Esmail does very well. He just cuts to the chase on on character development. Okay, you've got this couple um, living in in New York City with their their two children, two teen children, one's 16, one's 13, I believe, and uh, <clears throat> they decide the wife, who's who's very dominant. She's the she's the alpha female in this movie. She's the one that that uh, controls the family. Uh, she declares, "Hey, we're going out to to uh, the across the river. And we're going to get this nice house, and it's like a you know basically a, a vacation, a spot vacation." She just decided we're going to do that today. And uh, she's an ad executive. Her husband's a a professor at a community college. And so he's like, "Oh, okay, whatever. I guess you know he's the follower. She's the leader." So they get there, and you can already see right from the beginning there, there's odd things happening. You can't really tell what's going on. Um, nobody can. But then they get there, and they decide to to go to the beach. And while they're at the beach, they look up, they see this huge oil tanker heading towards them, slowly creeping towards the beach. I mean, it's they did a good job of expressing how it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, they they serve breakfast. They can still see it. It's, it's just creeping along, and then all of a sudden, it's getting closer and closer and closer. They realize that it's going to, it's going to beach itself. And so they get up and they run and they're scared and and yada yada yada. It's like how why would an oil tanker just drive up on uh, flow sail up onto the beach? So they go back home. Um, internet's down, phones are down, televisions down. They're not too concerned at this point. You know they have burgers and then they go to sleep and they're they're about to go to sleep and they get um, knocking at the door and the owner of the house because this is like basically an Airbnb. The owner of the house. Uh, the, uh, the black man and his daughter, uh, he goes by G.H., that's right, G.H., George, G.H., he's uh, he's the owner of the house, and this is where the racism starts to creep in. You know, you get uh, Julie Roberts like, oh, so you own this beautiful house? You know, insinuating that how could that be just be because he's black, right? So they get, and uh, they're, they're saying that you know, there's a blackout in New York City, and he doesn't want to drive all the way back, and they want to just stay there for the night at his house anyway, um, Julia Roberts doesn't want them to because she's racist, and Ethan Hunt or Ethan Hawke's uh, Ethan Hunt, Ethan Hawke's character is like, well, you know, we might as well have their house, and and she's like, how can we know for sure? We we you know, what if they're just pretending? And it was stupid because he's got a key to the locked liquor cabinet, so why? Of course it's his house, but whatever. The racism trumps all, right? <laughs> so, so anyway, I'm gonna fast forward. I'm I'm taking too long on this. Fast forward, it turns out that it is basically uh, the apocalypse. It's a cyber attack, and uh, power's out, and there's the hackers are are taking down everything. So they start trying to figure out what to do. There's no other buddy around. Okay, nobody else is around. Nobody's. They can. They're just on the outskirts of the city. I mean, you can see the city from one of their backyards. It's right across the river. For anybody who's familiar with New York City, so it's not that far. You cross the bridge; it's probably you know um, without traffic. If you're if you were driving without traffic, it's probably a 20, 30 minute drive once you cross the bridge. But but they don't talk about that. Uh, well, I'll talk about that here in a second. Anyway, uh, it's been a long time since I did a movie review, so bear with me. Um, and I haven't done a movie synopsis, I don't think ever. So <laughs> not, at least not not on air. So uh, so so bear with me. So. Sat phones, they try those, they're not working, that's bad because a sat phone, for those who don't know, and this is probably the only accurate thing they said as far as the end of the world goes, um, he said, look, sat phone, went to my neighbor's house, got their sat phone, uh, as long as you have line of sight with the sky, then you have access, like it's not the the uh, the way that sat phones work, if you have the sat phone in the sky, they work perfectly, if you're indoors, they won't work, if you're underground, they won't work, you have to have line of sight, that's how sat phones work fact that it didn't work it's like okay so that's not good and they start inquiring and they start asking the uh or they start getting into more details they're, they're being forced to trust each other they st start asking gh why he was really there julia roberts does and she he basically explains that look i had this guy there's a, a client of mine he's rich i'm not going to say who you would know his name he's in the he's uh uh works with defense contractors very rich and like he's he says something, and this is the part where where I'll get to, and it's the important message. One of the important messages of this movie that was delivered was done during this point. Of course, the the character they don't say who who it is. Uh, it's sort of implied. I mean, you could pick out a few different people. I took it as they were talking about Dick Cheney, okay. But but we'll get to that. 
So they go through, and uh, you know, first they're going to try to to escape. To go, the the white family is going to try to escape and go to the sister's house in New Jersey. Um, they can't because of a very comical scene where a bunch of self-driving Teslas are crashing into each other. <laughs> <laughs> you can't in today's world you can't have a, a movie that doesn't take a stab a leftist stab at elon musk right so all these white teslas crashing into each other um almost killing everybody and it was it was great <laughs> that was the most entertaining part of the movie so they end up getting stuck back together again this is where the part that's where it starts to get really weird we start hearing noises these noises it's implied later that these are microwave attacks very similar to to the alleged, um, I'm very skeptical of this, but the Havana attacks, you know, microwave attacks that, that, uh, but done at an intensity that is, they have to cover their ears. There's like two or three of these throughout the movie. They have to cover their ears. And at one point, the, um, the son, uh, doesn't cover his ears fast enough. He even makes a note. I probably should have covered my ears faster. Now I don't feel weird. And then later on his teeth start falling out. <laughs> I laugh, but, um, but it, it's it's it was a it was a shocking throw in. This is supposed to be a thriller, like I said, and it's really more of a drama with with a few sort of thrilling parts, like a plane crash stuff like that. Turns out nothing's working. This has been a cyber attack, and they don't even ever declare who it is. And that's part of the that's part of the the whole shtick of this movie is that is it is it Islam? Is it China? There's reports from different areas where where you don't know who the bad guys are, and you you never know who the bad guys are. The only thing that we do know, I'm glad that they didn't go down the road of, oh, it's aliens. Okay, there was no implication, no even attempt to, to pretend like these are aliens that are causing all this. It seems to be uh, very clearly a, an attack. Some would argue that the attack was internal. That in other words, this is um, the American deep state taking out America. That's I'm very skeptical of that notion here, uh, but it's possible. The most likely scenario is that it is a, a cabal of of uh, anti-American nations or non-nation organizations that are that are engaged in this. First, take out the the infrastructure or the communications, right? I shouldn't say infrastructure. Take out the power. Uh, take out the uh, internet. Take out phone communications and start dropping propaganda pamphlets everywhere, right? That that was that's actually literally part of the movie. So fast forward, and uh, you know, there's nuclear attacks, or they don't. They don't explicitly say nuclear, but there's uh, attacks that appear to be nuclear on New York City. The deer are acting all sorts of crazy weird. I'll get into that here in a minute. And uh, then the movie ends. You don't know what happens. You don't know. They, there's a little bit of an interaction with a with a doomsday prepper played by Kevin Bacon. But otherwise, you know, it's um, it's one of those question mark movies. Did they make it? Did they not make it? And that's it. So let's get into the messages now. Now that you have an understanding, a very well, you don't have an understanding because I didn't do a very good job of explaining the movie. But now that now that you have somewhat of an understanding that it's a post-apocalyptic or a, a I shouldn't say post-apocalyptic, it's a an apocalyptic movie. This is the the apocalypse as it's happening according to to uh, to this book, this movie, and the Obamas. So let's get into what I believe to be the the uh, true messages were they the reason they stirred up so much controversy and again these first two these are throw-ins they're not they're not the the main message they are they are messages that they p put in there for the sake of doing what they do okay pushing evil the way that they love to push evil first one is bubble biblical 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 understanding ridiculed of all the flaws with this movie this is the least important some would say quote hey uh, leaving out a biblical understanding of the end times is a big deal, and I would tell those people that if you are, if you're getting your your biblical guidance from Hollywood, then you're doing it wrong. We expect Hollywood. If you're going to watch a Hollywood movie, if it's not definitely, clearly, unambiguously a Christian movie, then you're not going to you're not going to get any message that Hollywood hates the faith. They hate God. I think in many ways. And when I say that, I don't want to lump everybody in Hollywood together. I know there's there are those who who are Christians, those who do believe. But they're few and far between, and they're not uh, they're not uh, what's the word for it? They're not open with it. Is the best way to put it. But yeah, so don't get your don't get your biblical understanding from Hollywood. 
Uh, they took a couple of steps towards ridiculing the Bible. These jabs were subtle and were f more for driving the plot than directly attacking the uh, biblical principles. It's far more telling that the movie doesn't allow the, uh, the audience to entertain the idea of God's influence in the end times. That is the big, you know, the, it's, again, this is a minor point, but this is the big part of that minor point, is that here it's clear that they're in the midst of the apocalypse. And at no point do any of the characters even question or think about, is this, is this the book of Revelation? Is this, let me think back to, to what I learned about the book of Daniel or Ezekiel or anything like that, or is this a message from God? No, I mean, there's no prayer, there's no thought. Like, it's like, no, yeah, no, nah, nah. we, we, we don't talk about that here. There, there is one mention about a story by the daughter, the, the white daughter. She does, she does mention a, an allegory that's, I guess you could say it's not biblical, but it does mention God. There's a couple of other mentions of God or prayer in the movie, but the, both all three of them are essentially throwaways. They're dismissed, and that's the point. That's the message is that, hey, if and when the crap hits the fan, because it's about to hit the fan, folks, when it does happen, don't pray. Don't think about God. You know, think about, think about the real world, as they like to put it. Think about what's really happening. That's where you need to put your focus. Don't, don't, don't wonder about prophecy. Don't wonder about about salvation. Don't wonder about God's judgment. Just assume that it's the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, the Iranians, whoever. Think it's aliens. Think it's a deep, deep state. Just don't. Don't think about God. Again, like I said, this is something where this wasn't an intentional. It's not like, oh my gosh, we got to do a movie so that we can stick this point in. You could do any movie and stick that point in any movie. But they do a very clever job. There are no attacks against the faith. That's important. That's important in these movies. Because once they actually go anti-faith, that's where they, they the messaging gets lost. This is, this is a, uh, a case study in subtlety within a movie that, that's talking about huge topics. Again, subliminal. And I'm not talking about subliminal messaging. Like It's, it's subliminal, uh, I guess you could say, seed planting. Unconscious is the better word for it. They're planting these seeds unconsciously. Number two, false depictions of uh, the, the crap hits the fan scenario. Okay. As I'm sure most of you know, I am a, a prepper, a late prepper, so to speak. I started prepping and then, but only in the last few years. The reason being is that I used to think it was crazy. Okay. When Y2K was popping up and everybody's heading for the hills, I'm like, guys, it's not going to be that big of a deal. And it wasn't. You know, when the uh, when the economic uh, downturn of 2008 and 2009 happens, like, oh, yeah, this is bad. But no, don't go start pulling out all your money out of the bank and putting it in in uh, bags under the under the bed. Don't worry. Don't go buy gold. What are you guys doing? The stock market's going to bounce back. If anything, now's the time to buy, 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 right? Get it. Take this downturn and then and then ride it all the way. It'll take a few years, but we'll get there. Now, when Obamacare came out, I did get a little, I got a little taste of prepping. You know, talk to my wife. It's like, hey, yeah, well, we just get a couple of buckets, maybe a couple of gas masks, a couple of ba bug out bags, and we'll call it a day. You know, spent a little bit of money uh, and and got a little prepared. It's funny because now looking back, I realized how completely unprepared we were, but we were thought, oh my gosh, yes, we've got our bug out bags, you know, so that we can take our family and go hiking in the woods, I guess, <laughs> in the middle of of uh, Orange County, California. It's like, it was so we were dumb. But <laughs> hopefully we're not dumb now. But um, but yeah, so I didn't jump to any conclusions there. I didn't even jump to, I was the guy that during tw in 2020, I was saying, what are you guys doing? Why is Why do I have to wait in line to get one roll of toilet paper? This is ridiculous. You guys are blowing this out of proportion. Okay, stop taking all the toilet paper. Why do you need a two-year supply of toilet paper? Fast forward to here, the end of 2023, beginning of 2024, and I have a three or four year supply of toilet paper because things have changed. Anyway, point is, is that, is that uh, as a prepper, I do, I've come to the conclusion that there's a whole lot of bad prepper information out there. And I'm not just talking about like those shows, which I never got to watch any of them, but those shows about, you know, how doomsday preppers are crazy. There's a couple of television shows trying to, trying to insult doomsday preppers. I'm not talking about just that. 
I'm saying that there's there's actually misinformation. The more that I learn, the more that I realize. And I, uh, to be clear, I don't think most of it. I think it's just bad advice. Like I was reading. I'm not going to say which one or, or even highlight any of the any of the negatives in it because I don't want you to get any bad ideas. But there was a list that I, I was sent. It was a list of uh, basically the top, the most important items, the hierarchy of needs, so to speak, in a prepper situation. Um, and this specifically for a bug out bag, you know, this is what you should definitely have in your bug out bag. And I would say at least 30% of it was wrong. I mean, it was, it was actually incorrect. Like I know what well, is your opinion. No, no, no. <laughs> there are, there are certain accepted, you know, you have got to have this in your bug out bag. You got to have this in your bug out bag. I've read enough of these articles and, and seen enough videos to realize that, that there are certain things that you definitely obviously need. And there's certain things that are just, you know, would be nice to have. And then there's certain things where it's like, no, don't do that. That's just going to take up useless or that's going to take up important space and, and add add important weight to your bags, but won't actually deliver much positive. Um, so, yeah, I didn't post that article for obvious reasons. It, it's, it was incorrect. Point I'm trying to get at is this, is that there are those who give bad advice. That's fine. There's misinformation i don't think there's a whole lot of disinformation out there but there's definitely misinformation well this movie this movie delivered on disinformation I mean, they actually went so far as to to not just ridicule but to 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 paint an inappropriate seed of what these scenarios will look like whenever there's a whole lot more let me get into what i wrote and then i'll explain uh, false depictions of the the crap hits the fan scenario where to begin? As usual, they depict doomsday preppers as either American flag-waving, shotgun-holding crazy people like Kevin Bacon's character, or self-indulgent rich people who will spend the end times in a literal vault with canned foods and a huge library of DVDs. It's true. I mean, that part. Uh, I think a lot of people would like that. Then there's the fact that being so close to the city, in this case, New York City, they did, uh, did not result in seeing masses of people leaving. In fact... Nobody apparently walked across the bridge to find safety in the nearby suburbs. There's a reason why I, I would tell people pretty much every show, leave the city. Get out of the city if you can, okay? If you have the means and you live in the city, get out. I don't care if it's if it's New York City or Akron, okay? Get out of major metros. There are those of you who cannot. I happen to be one of them. It's, it's so funny. I'm not being hypocritical. I do appreciate that there are many of us who either do not have the means or who have certain attachments that keep us from leaving the city. In our case, it's a medical attachment. Okay, We can't be far away from a major hospital, in, in specifically certain, certain very specific hospitals. We have to be close to certain doctors because of a med medical scenario within our family. Otherwise, there's no way I would still be in California. I assure you of that. And I definitely wouldn't be in Metro California. But, you know, I, I appreciate that there are those who, who can't leave. And maybe you just don't want to. You know, I know there's a lot of, and maybe not a lot, but there are at least a few of you out there that are like, you know what, I'm fine. I know that it's going to get bad, uh, but I need my friends. I need my relatives. I need to my job. I need to be here. That's a choice. If it is a choice that you make, so be it, okay? Uh, we, we make choices in our lives based upon circumstances. I can urge you all all until I'm, my, I'm blue in the face to leave the cities. But if you just don't want to, you just don't want to. And I get that. Okay, but, but fast, back to the movie. I also often say leave the suburbs because what's going to happen when, when crap starts going really bad in the cities? A lot of people are going to try to get out. Depending upon the scenario, there's certain scenarios where people will be forced to stay, martial law, there's certain scenarios where they won't be forced to stay, there's certain scenarios where they won't want to leave. You know, if they start deploying 15-minute cities, and the only way that you can get, get food is to be in the cities. There's going to be, there will be reasons to either leave the city or not leave the city, uh, depending upon the scenario. In those scenarios where people are suddenly wanting to leave the city, they're going to invade the suburbs, especially if it's a, a situation where there's it's not easy to get around via um, uh, vehicles. Let's say EMP, for example. Let's say some, some scenario where you can't just drive out of the city. Well, people, uh, they're going to pack up their stuff, and a lot of them are going to try to walk away from this situation. And in this case with New York City, I mean, they're within walking distance. It maybe it might take a day or two to do it, but but people will leave. If they, they, they can't get out via car, they're not going to stick around. Things are, are going south in a hurry. They're going to leave. They're going to walk to the suburbs. So there should have been people very present in this. this. It's over the course of like three or four days. 
they should they would have seen people, but they didn't, and that's uh, that's misleading. Not a big deal, but it is misleading. Again, if you're going to do a movie about a uh, an apocalyptic situation, you have to try to give people the right the right impression of what that's going to look like. In this case, they give an extremely wrong impression. And it's not just about not seeing anybody walking across. Let me get back to the article. Perhaps worst of all is that they're, they were never in any real danger. They had power and water despite a massive cyber attack that crashed planes, oil tankers, and a small army of self-driving Teslas. How ludicrous would it be for hackers to take down everything but leave electricity and water and running water on in an area across the river from New York City? It just wouldn't happen. I started thinking, you know, they keep turning on the faucet and drinking water, and it's like, what? They th what? Doesn't make sense. As more Americans become focused on self-sustainability and preparedness, this movie makes it all seem not so bad. The reality is, in a scenario like the, the one from the movie, chaos would leave the city and find its way to the suburbs within a day, two at the most. Utilities would stop working immediately, especially considering that this cyber attack that was the catalyst for the storyline specifically targeted the grid again it's it was one of those things where they the intention and i know this is for the sake of the movie they didn't want that to be the concern they didn't want them wondering and at no point in the movie they're thinking oh we're we're gonna get you know in all these apocalyptic movies they always say you know we got to get food and water and shelter in this case they were they were eating they were drinking they had no concern about shelter or electricity or anything I mean, it's kind of like like they were just living living normal lives in this big fancy house, and just the only difference is nobody's around. There's some weird sounds every now and then, and the deer are trying to to attack them or something. That was it. Otherwise, running water, working electricity, plenty of food, plenty of booze. They, they drink a whole lot of booze in the movie. Lots of wine, lots of champagne, lots of lots of whatever. Bottom line is that this. Uh, this apocalyptic movie depicted the apocalypse as not so bad. They didn't give any indication of the turmoil that's going to ensue, regardless of what the scenario is. There will be turmoil of some sort. What that turmoil is will depend upon what the scenario is. In this case, there was none. I mean, the worst thing that could happen to them is that the deer were going to break through the glass or maybe a plane would crash on them because they show a couple of plane crashes, or maybe they'll get nuked. But those aren't necessarily the things that most Americans would have to concern themselves with. I know it's subtle. Like I said, we're building up to the big one here. You might say that's not a big deal because it's really not a prepper movie. But it, again, plants the seed. The seed here that they're planting is one of, don't there's no need to be prepared. It's not going to be that bad. Not the primary one, but let's get to the primary one. And this here is the one where, when I heard this, I realized that's it. That's why Barack and Michelle Obama are involved. That's why they're they're trying to push this this racist narrative. That's why they're trying to build up controversy. This is why they don't care, knowing that they're going to get destroyed by the uh, audience scores, you know, which, I mean, for many of us, I, that's the only thing I look at. I don't care if a movie's got a an 85 amongst critics. If it's got a, a 50 amongst the audience, I'm not going to watch it. Okay, except in this case where I was watching it for the sake of of uh, <laughs> of research. I don't watch very mo mo many movies at all anymore. I used to. I came out to California with the intention of of getting into the movies. I know that sounds crazy, but I took a job in California all of those decades ago, before Hollywood became so woke when when it wasn't. It wasn't just, uh, you know, you, I didn't, I assumed that, I wrongly assumed that even at the time, that a conservative Christian could still operate in Hollywood. You know, you saw a few of them. People would talk about it. I mean, back then, even Tom Hanks would praise God when he was accepting his awards, right? Obviously, things have changed. But back then, I did come out here for the sake of, of getting into, of writing, writing a screenplays. That's what I wanted to do. I know, laugh, but that's the truth. But I don't watch them anymore. I had to watch this one for the sake of, of doing today's show. Uh, but now we get into the messaging itself. This is the part where where uh, this is why they made the movie and why they generated the buzz that they do. Nobody's pulling the strings. That's the message. And the scene where it's delivered, 
very conspicuously in the middle, very conspicuously set in a tone where it's like, all right, you got to lean in and pay attention. It's, it's described slowly. It's very dramatic. Lots of eye contact. And it was, it was a very powerful message. It's a message that I hadn't heard before, at least not in movies. That message has now been delivered to millions of people. It will continue to be delivered. And it's a message that whether it registers subconsciously or whether people are, are openly talking about it, it's the bad message. Nobody is pulling the strings, according to this movie. The primary message delivered by the movie is that all of us crazy conspiracy theorists have everything wrong. They, they even said our notion that the powers that be are pulling the strings is lazy. They use the word lazy. Oh, it's too lazy to, you know, to, to think that, that there's this powerful cabal you know, pulling all the strings. That's lazy. Nobody's pulling the strings, according to this movie. The globalist elites are just as lost as the rest of us, according to the movie. Um, they're having, uh, the only thing they get is they, they get a heads up so they can get out of Dodge before anyone else. This is a bald faced lie, but it's a compelling thought that will stick with viewers for a long time, maybe indefinitely. It's one of the most memorable, memorable scenes as, uh, Mahershala Ali's GH character explains his in interactions with an unnamed client who sounds like Dick Cheney. According to GH, the people we think of as the bad guys are just getting a head start to reach their bunkers. That's it. They don't, they're not really pulling the strings. They're not causing any of the bad stuff. They're just as scared as we are, maybe a little bit less scared because they've got their, their billion-dollar bunkers they can go to and ride it out. So according to this movie, Klaus Schwab, George Soros, Bill Gates, and the Bushes aren't really bad guys in this scenario. They're just lucky and rich enough to escape if this movie's primary message is to be believed. Of course, the Obamas fall into this category as well, conveniently. Leave the World Behind is getting a ton of watches from both the right and the left. On cue, conservative and alternative media took the bait and cranked up the outrage machine by invoking anti-white hatred. That was by design. Now, viewers will have the destructive seeds planted without even noticing them as the, they focus on the race-baiting component. But as we should have learned by now, when a negative message is so blatant, it wasn't really the message that they wanted delivered. This wasn't about trying to, to get black people to hate white people. This wasn't about getting white people to hate black people. This wasn't about sparking more of the race wars. It's, you know, that's, again, it was a trap. And it's an obvious trap. Because in both cases, whether it's the black daughter you know, not trusting any white people at all, wanting her dad to never trust white people, or whether it's the white wife who's who's like, you know, I mean, this wasn't like uh, one of those, oh, it's an implied, you know, subtle racism. No, no, she she ba she blatantly didn't, you know, in the beginning, you know, she was just like, yeah, like, do you really trust these people because they, you know, they come here late at night? I mean, the guy had the key to, it was obvious that this was him, that this was his house. I mean, obvious from within three minutes of talking. He couldn't, didn't smell a con. He had the key to his, to his own liquor cabinet. He knew the inside and out where things were. He knew about the, the room in the basement. Okay. And there, her excuse for being skeptical was what if he's the, the contractor and she's the maid? Okay. <laughs> it was, but the thing is, is that they both, both the, the racist daughter and the racist wife, they're portrayed as being negative. Okay, it's not trying to sell their racism. It's it's supposed to to hate on their racism. And by the end, the two are are in agreement. I mean, they literally at one point hug it out, sort of. They don't hug it out. They hug out the fact that they didn't get eaten by the herd of deer. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> there was a herd of deer, and they had to scream at them. And then the deer finally left. You know, it was crazy. It's horrible CGI, by the way. I'm, I'm very disappointed in that aspect of it. That was. It's like, really, we still have to get. I mean, the the lead buck, you know, the 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 alpha buck was like the worst CGI I'd seen in in, in five or ten years. It was horrible. Anyway, yeah, the racism was just the hook. It was just to get right conservatives buzzing about it and to get you to watch it. That's it. Don't um. Don't get too caught up in that. The messaging is the one that we have to counter. Number one, 
if and when things go south, which if we are in the end times, it looks like that's going to, to happen. And even if we're not in the end times, it looks like that's going to happen. Things are, are on, on the verge of going south. So be ready, but look up, be prepared, read your Bible. Whether this is the end times or not, pray, pray, pray. Don't, don't ever, no matter what, don't ever let anybody make you dismiss your, your love and belief in God and Jesus. Period. The movie does depict that. They, they, they do worse than hating on it. They blow it off. They ridicule it mildly. But most importantly, that's not even a consideration. I mean, if you've got planes falling out of the sky, you've got, you know, what, what's clear, you know, deer running around in huge herds keep coming in your backyard and surrounding you and cornering you. You've got all these strange things happening, apocalyptic things then your first thought should be, what is this, what's God telling us? And that was not even the first, second, third, or fifth, fifth thought in this movie. Number two, prepping for the end times takes good research. And their message is that it's a piece of cake, okay? When the cyber attack comes and planes are falling out of the sky and oil tankers are, are crashing onto the beach and there's pandemonium, at least in the city, don't worry, nobody's going to come out in the suburbs. Don't worry, you'll have plenty of food, water. Don't worry, the grid will, will stay up. You'll still have running water and you'll still have electricity and you'll still have plenty of wine. It's not going to be like that. You have to actually get truly prepared. And it's funny because at the very end, you get to see the bunker. I'll admit, that was the best part of the movie. I was jealous. I was jealous. There was a doomsday bunker that this rich couple, rich family had made, uh, had built. And it was, I'm like, ooh, I almost wanted to pause and start taking notes. It's like, oh, that's a good idea. Ooh, that looks, nice. That's, that's wasted space. What are they thinking with that? Oh, look at that. I hadn't thought of that one before. I mean, not literally, but but uh, yeah, it was, I mean, that's, don't dismiss God. Don't dismiss uh, being properly prepared. And then, of course, this last message regarding the no, nobody's pulling the strings. They are pulling the strings. It's conspicuous that Barack and Michelle Obama are executive producers on a movie that's trying to say, don't worry, the globalist elite cabal, they're not really in control. Okay, that scene, again, that scene was very powerful. Because it's like, you know, we picture these this uh, cabal of, of bad guys, you know, pulling all the strings, and in reality, nobody's pulling the strings. That's coming from one of the string pullers. In this case, it was they're, they're saying it was Dick Cheney, or they didn't say it, but it was a Dick, Dick Cheney-like character. Super rich guy with uh, with connections to, you would recognize his name, and connections to the uh, the defense industry. That's all we know about him. We know, oh, and, and he laughs at every, every joke, but he didn't laugh at the last joke. The last joke was, you know, as he's moving all of his money out the day before the, the events started taking place, he moves um, most of his money to somewhere else, and he was taking a trip, leaving and uh, he'd be gone for a while <laughs> and when uh when uh gh asked him you know oh i thought you only met during the winter solstice with your b buddies and the when the when dick cheney didn't laugh at that joke it's like oh crap something really bad is happening that was his sign to go head towards his his home uh and uh have to deal with julia roberts you get the idea so overall uh, watch it or don't but if you do watch it Keep all these things in mind. Make sure that you don't let that any of the false messages uh, get planted in your brain. You know, people say, "Oh, you have to totally avoid all forms of negative messaging," and I disagree. You have to be aware of what they are. You have to not allow them to affect you. But there, it's we have to we have to be able to explain to people. For example, friends and family. You know, they they go, they watch this movie. Maybe they start talking about, "Hey, you know, uh, I know you're a prepper." Uh, you know, I was just, just watching this movie the other day uh, about the end of the world and it's got Julia Roberts in it. And I wanted to talk to you about prepping. It's like, oh, the, your response should be something like, oh, good. You know, I heard, I, I didn't watch the movie, but I did hear about it. And I heard how it gave a really uh, unrealistic uh, view of what, what things will be like. I'd be like, really? What do you mean? It's like, well, I heard they had like running water and electricity. It's like, oh yeah, they did. It's like, so so they're suggesting that, that a suburb just outside of New York City would still have running water and electricity after a cyber attack took out, took out the, uh, the grid 
and uh, crashed planes and oil tankers. Well, huh, I didn't think of it like that. You're right. You're right. I sound like uh, Finster from <laughs> from The Usual Suspects. Uh, man, I, I, I can't do impressions. I really can't. But you get the idea. You know, maybe this is an opportunity for you to talk to these people about that. Maybe it's like, hey, you know, uh, yeah, I saw this movie. It was uh, there's this concept that that uh, I never thought of before, where where maybe you know, and you always say that the bad guys, or maybe they won't even mention the movie. You can expect this, especially if if you have one of those those people that think that you're a conspiracy theorist and and they're skeptics, and it's like, hey, you know what? I was thinking, um, I know you think that there's this whole cabal of people that are pulling all the strings, but let me ask you this: What if they're just as scared? What if what if nobody's actually pulling the strings? And that's when you say, oh, so you, you watched uh, Leave the World Behind. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, the one by, by uh, with executive producer Barack and Michelle Obama, who uh, are part of this global silica ball. You don't think that it's conspicuous that they would make a movie that, that basically says that the cabal that they're a part of is not actually pulling the strings? Yeah, I mean... I mean, I guess, I guess you get, you got a point there. And did you think it was kind of weird that that during the apocalypse, when when a cyber attack takes everything down, they still have running water and electricity and plenty of wine, and then in <laughs> <and> the deer, <laughs> it's like, oh well, yeah, okay, okay. So maybe you got a point. Maybe it was dumb. So maybe, maybe, maybe it was dumb. I don't know. I don't even know who I'm impersonating there. You get the idea. Bottom line is this: we are all of us. We are in crazy times. And there's going to be messaging that tries to take us away from the truth. I, I said in the beginning of the segment, I'm not going to talk about predictive programming because there's there's a lot of bad information. I won't say misinformation. I think there's a lot of bad information. I think there's just there's just uh, people have the right ideas, but they're either skewing it improperly or they're presenting it improperly. There are some good ones, though, out there. And I, unfortunately, am not one that can deliver a good message about predictive programming. So that's why I'm not. I didn't talk about it during this, but I would encourage people to learn about it, and especially if you are going to watch this movie, learn more about predictive programming before you watch this movie, or at least very, very shortly afterwards. Secondly, we are, we are in a time where it's either the end times or an echo of it. In other words, we can and should expect events to get crazy from here, and how we respond to that craziness. That will determine a lot about whether or not we survive. I always say get out of the cities. I always say get your food, water, ammunition, meds, Bibles, and and precious metals. I say these things because you need to. And if you can't, I understand. At least start. At least have the Bibles. But do what you can. Do what you can to to uh, how what's the word for it? Do what you can to prepare spiritually above all else, but also to make sure that you have an exit. If you can't prepare, if you can't, if you don't have a a uh, you know, bunch of bug out bags or food or ammunition or water stored at your home, or maybe you can't, at the very least figure out how to get out of whatever situation you're in. And if that's beyond means, so be it. Then ma- make sure you've got your Bibles. I don't want people to be scared because this isn't a scary time. It's a concerning time for many people. We are going to go through hard times, whether it's the end times or not. But I don't want people to go through scared. I want you to be number one. One of the, it's funny. I, I, I told my wife this the other day. I can't believe it. I don't think I've ever said it on the show. But one of the reasons that I tell people to get prepared, you know, spiritually first, but then also physically, you know, is it's not because I want you to be able to survive for two decades you know, I mean, that would be nice, but that's not the main goal. The main goal is that you go into whatever the end times looks like, that you go into it at least feeling less fear. That's important. If we get too fearful, that's when we can, we're more vulnerable to losing our faith. That's when we're more, more vulnerable to doing the wrong things. When we have more, I guess you could say, uh, confidence in our situation, is it real? Probably not. I mean, if you if if you're in an area that gets nuked, just as an example, it doesn't matter how many bug out bags you got. <laughs> right? But at least you can go forward with less fear than if you weren't prepared. That's more important 
than just the, the ability to sustain yourself for an extended period of time, at least in my humble opinion. Watch the movie if you want. I would say that it's a decent movie. I would say that if you're prepared to watch it, if you're prepared with understanding what the underlying messages are so that they don't creep into you, plant seeds in your in your subconscious or anything like that, then yeah, it's long. It's like two hours, 20 minutes. It's a longer movie uh, and it's slow. There's times when it goes real slow, but maybe it would be worth, maybe you'll see things that I didn't see. Maybe you'll catch even more subliminals or unconscious messages that I just didn't even notice. Who knows? Lord willing, I will be back very soon with another episode. But in the meantime, you'll stay strong. Stay safe. Oh, you know what? Before I... <laughs> totally forgot. I won't do the entire segment. I haven't been giving enough attention to my sponsor, Genesis Gold Group. Go to JDRGold.com and learn how they can help you. Please do so. Uh, because we haven't... We don't know what the future holds. Lord willing, I will be back very soon with another episode. But in the meantime, y'all stay strong, stay safe. And